Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, I had a, quite an spiritual experience this week sitting in dialysis. And uh, if you, if anybody out here who's familiar with dialysis because you've been a patient at one or are, you quickly learn that if you have tears coming down your face, they're going to be all over you. You know, when I'm trying to rest sometimes with my eyes closed, they'll wake me up to ask me if I'm okay because I've got my eyes closed. They're very, very on top of things. Well, I had some tearful moments this week sitting in the chair, remembering what God has done in this church. I couldn't stop the tears. I just couldn't stop them. Of the faithfulness of God over these last 70 years, it started in a kitchen with one lady in the church who wanted to start a work in this area. And the first service began in her kitchen in Lipsick, out in Lipsick, uh, on Lipsick Road, to where we are today. And it all started because of God. I've entitled the message today, God is never done. In Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And he's proven to be with us the last 70 years. And then Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18 from the Amplified says, Where there is no vision, that means no revelation of God and his word. The people are unrestrained. But happy and blessed are those who keep the law of God. There's something about this verse that stands out that isn't really caught right away until you study it. The ideal here is that where there's no vision, people perish. There's a general meaning that says, if I don't have, if I don't see what God sees around us, if I don't see that vision of God, how are they going to ever hear about God if we don't take it to them? Because we don't see the vision. But I found out there was something deeper going on in this verse. That what was going on deeper was that it was saying that where there's no vision of God in my life, first and foremost, there could be no vision to see the other people who need God. So the first vision I need to have was the vision of God in my own life and the vision of God that you have in your life. And if you thought that Angela and I brought the vision to this church, where it is today, I want to just redirect your thinking because God did birth a vision in us. So we carried out a vision that God gave us. But we did not bring the vision originally because it was already here. What we brought was our calling into the ministry as young people with a desire and a passion for reaching the lost. And God, he matched up our calling to the vision that he started 70 years ago. And let me tell you something about God. He's never lost his vision. <laughs> we in the natural can lose our vision. But boy, I tell you spiritually, we don't want to lose our vision. God has never lost his vision. God set up a plan in Scripture. And here's what it says in Ephesians 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip people for his work of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. That's our belief. That's our trust in God. And in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love. That truth has to do with the knowledge we have of God. 
we'll, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who was the head that is Christ. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Who do you think the each part is? All of us. Does uh, its work. So let's go to the top for just a moment. Let's look at this word equip. Over the years, God birthed something within my heart at a, as a very first, within the first year or so. I had this urge and God gave me the gift of administration. First Corinthians 12, 28. Gift of administration is the gift and the ability to be able to manage the work of God in the Greek. Having discretion to handle the work of God. He, God gave me that ability. He gave me that gifting. And I began to write manuals. And within a year or so, I'd written the first manual on how we as a church come together and how we can, through, the, through coming together, and I, I taught us specific steps and how to be an organized church, how to be a together church, but how we can start reaching our community. And then over the course of years, I wrote, wrote over 20 different manuals on leadership training and working manuals, even six marriage manuals, so that could, we could be equipped as the saints of God. For what purpose? Well, we go back to the very last word we just read, and it said work. So that in all that training over all those years and coming together, we would learn how to be the best working church there was, which came out of work was the hard work idea. Remember the hard work we talked about? You remember what work stood for? Work stood for W, winning the people over. The O stood for being as organized as the church as we could be, because I think half the battle of church growth is being organized in what you're doing. And then the R stood for being relevant to the day in which we live. You hang on to the message, but the methods have to change. We become relevant. And last but not least, the K stood for kicking the door of opportunity wide open. And this church, over the past 40 years, has kicked a lot of doors open into the community. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And as Pastor Ryan continues to follow this directive, God is going to do even more because God is not done yet. Let's go back. To some history. 45 years ago, on October 14th, 1979, was our first service. And in my board interview that happened in September of that year, 1979, as I went before the board to candidate that next Sunday, that Sunday morning, the board asked me one question after we had a nice discussion. They said, what would you like from us as a board? And the first thing I said was, number one, I would like to have unlimited spending for evangelism and the budget. And number two, because I had been a youth pastor, even as I was pastored in Olivet, Michigan for six years, almost six years, I still was the youth pastor there. I wanted to make sure that I could still lead the youth at this church until one day it was able to be led by someone else. The board granted both of those, and you can see they fulfilled their commitment. I was given one request. Don't talk about the building program. When I came to Dover, there was plans on the wall. And one year later, I knew inside that it was time. I couldn't take it any longer. I knew it was time to step out of the boat and walk on the water to meet Jesus. Now, let me explain to you why. Because that Sunday morning on that day, that was the message the Lord gave me in my spirit for the church, for the hour. Church, it's time to step out of the boat and walk on water to Jesus. Because God had a plan in his vision when he started the church to go from a rowboat to a battleship. That we were to step up the efforts. We were to step up to go forward, to be able to fit all the people that God was going to bring in to man the battleship as we faced 
what was going to happen in the future in this community. You know, someone once said, a ship looks beautiful in the harbor at the dock, but that's not why it was built. And so I want to take that same phrase and say this to you. A battleship, the church, looks beautiful and majestic sitting at the dock, but that's not what it was built for. This church looks beautiful sitting here on this, near this corner, but it was built for going out into the communities to reach the loss and fight the opposition that would come against the church. Then, if we were going to think that's not our role, if we don't want to do that, then what should we do? Well, we might as well just go back to the rowboat and finish our days relaxing in the waters. That's not what God wanted. As long as there is one lost soul, I remember preaching to the church in Governor's Avenue within the first year or so, I stood in the pulpit and I said, folks, I said two things. I said, I don't want to stay in a church that doesn't want to reach the loss. I will be moving on. I did say that. And I also said, as long as there's one soul in this community that does not know the Lord, one soul, then everything we do, everything we are, everything we spend is worth all of it to reach that one lost soul. And I believed that conviction. And as long as there is one lost soul drowning in the sea of life in this community, just one, it's still worth everything that's happened. It's still worth everything we do to reach just that one. Can I back that up with scripture? In Matthew, with the great, with the shepherd, saw that he had a hundred sheep, but he saw one was missing. And he decided to go out and leave the 99 who were safe in the fold to go out and find that one lost sheep. And he found him and he brought him back. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring something to your attention. You wouldn't be sitting here today if there wasn't that one shepherd. If there wasn't that one person, that friend, that preacher, that teacher, that article you read, there wouldn't, you wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be here today if there wasn't that one who left those who were safe in the fold and went out and found that lost one. We are the found lost ones today. So the board gave me permission to go ahead and change the plans. The plans that were on the wall would have only built the complete complex in one building project which would have caused a landlocked problem to growth in our church. We would have never been able to house what God had planned. Because we can't go with this set. We've got to, we got to think in terms of building by phases. So we could build phases big so we could add more to the phase. Instead of building all at one time and there was no room expansion to grow. So we decided to go for new plans. We got into the first phase. It was done around 1984. By the way, just so you know, on June 15th of this month, it was that 70 years ago, on June 15th, I got a letter the day that we dedicated the first phase, the multipurpose room. I received a letter in the mail that week from the original pastor who built the first, he started the first church here on, in Governors. He was the first known pastor sent me a letter congratulating us on the many years of ministry at Calvary. Can you believe we got that letter the same week we celebrated it on that day, how awesome that was. During this time and moving forward, the Lord laid in my heart a passage of scripture. I could see, and this is where vision comes in. When God puts that vision in you, this is, what, this is what I saw. Lord, we're not big enough. Lord, we don't have enough room. Lord, there's not going to be enough room because what you've got planned for this place is far bigger than this. And so I read Psalm, uh, Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. It says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your, de your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. This was about a passage of scripture that God would say, there are going to be nations that you will conquer. 
so you could spread out with all that I'm going to do for you. Well, I took this passage of scripture and made an analogy for us as a church. The Lord was saying to, to us, you need to spread out physically here. You need to go to the left. You need to go to the right. You need to, and I think, Lord, how are we going to do that? Because we have so much land to work with. Well, over the course of time, when, if you're going to enlarge your tent, stretch your tent, lengthen the cords, strengthen your cords, there's got to be a way to do that. So we went to the Lord and we started letting God unveil the vision. And we took this to mean that we needed to firm up all of our efforts because God had a plan. We built phase one, the multi-purpose building. We went to phase two four years later. We went to phase three around 14 years later. And during all this time, we had gone up to as many as three services on Sunday morning. And for two years, we went up on two years on Saturday night. So we was doing four services on a weekend for two years, and then back to three for the remainder until I phased out. Now, what was interesting was that when it got to be in the 11 o'clock service, when we was doing four services, I was set at the front and I'd lay my head against the wall. And one of those mornings, I started to fall asleep. I was tired. Three Sunday morning services, then coming back Sunday night, then doing Wednesday night, keeping up with all the schedule. I was a busy pastor. And, uh, but, but God brought a man into our lives, Sud Emerson. He lived back here in Penwood. He loved our school. He was so complimentary of our school. He says, I like the way, he's a realtor, he says, I like the way your school conducts themselves. I like how the kids act in our community around this area because, you know, kids can be rowdy and noisy. He loved, he loved our school. We, in fact, we've named our gym at the community center. There's a plaque outside the wall in honor of Sud Emerson because what he did was he decided to offer some property, a piece of land that this church sits on, about an acre of land. And he says, um, uh, I said, well, how much? He said, 250000 <laughs> said, okay, I took it to the board. The board agreed. We got it for 250000 And what was so beautiful was that over time, God moved on his heart. And over a five-year period, he gave that entire $250,000 back to the church in a program which the church was able to use to help keep going forward in building. We are very indebted to what Mr. M. Uh, Thunderson had done. Then a few years later, here comes the community center. Now, let me tell you, my wife reminded me, hon, you wanted that place for a long time. And we would pray over it. She would, I would. I found out other people were driving around that building praying for it, didn't even know it. But for some reason, God was put in our heart to get that place. I mean, did I ever get excited? Because it was a tennis court when we moved here, and then it was other businesses, and then it was a furniture store, two gentlemen, brothers. And boy, did I get excited when I saw them added a new building on the end of it. I said, Lord, there's the gym. I got really excited. I really, I'm serious. I got excited. Lord, they're adding to our building. And I said, Lord, your will be done. And lo and behold, a Martha Bell, who's now home with the Lord, came to me and says, Pastor, they're going to sell that building. And I found out this is a good time to be the first person to offer. So we did. To make a long story short, we agreed upon the settlement in order for us to be more affordable for us and to, to help us. They agreed to, re, to knock off 300000 as a donation for that building so we could get a hold of it. And boy, folks, it is a building that's used seven, right, Dorothy? Seven days a week. There might be a day, maybe Christmas Day, something like that. Seven days a week that building's in use for the community and for the church. God enlarged us. He, there's where you, you begin to dispossess some other kind of land. You're moving that way now to get some land and to be able to get what we need. So during the present time, God was preparing two young men to one day take hold of the vision along with what God wanted to do. The first young man who came along was my oldest son, Aaron. He was raised first five years in, in, in Olivet, Michigan, four and a half, five years, then the rest of his life here. And he became a trained educator and manager, administrator, trainer. I think some other things, he was very busy in management, 
in what was the NBA business, which is now called the Bank of America. When he moved back to Dover because of a job change to be working up at Wilmington area, only to later have the company trade hands, so they got rid of a thousand managers. Aaron was one of them. Aaron was invited to be on the school board. So he came on the school board, and to our amazement and surprise, it so it was that the current head of the school asked if we could bring Aaron on as the new leader of the school because she was stepping down to go into another business. So my, I stayed back. I let it be decided by the school board. They decided to bring Aaron on. And for the last many years, he has been here at the school, which had this past year of 401 students, with more to come next year. We need more, we need more land to take. We need more room. We are desperate need for room. The school would boom overnight if we had more room. Aaron, thank you for heeding the call of God and carrying God's vision and adding numerically to the church as well. Many of you are from the school. The places that you could have gone, Aaron, the places you could have been making much more money, you chose to follow the call of God in your life. Thank you. The next young man you know quite well, Pastor Ryan, who was a cum laude graduate from Valley Forge, University of Valley Forge, which, by the way, Aaron went to University of Valley Forge as well. And Aaron Ryan was raised in the church from infancy. And we have a picture of, we're going to put up here today of, was it already up there? Oh, that's cool. I look over there, it's there. Okay. So, I was sitting in my chair one day, and I, I just had this thought. This was several years ago. I thought, Lord, I find it interesting that he stepped forward to help my mother cut the ribbon going into this building. Little did I know at the time that this was part of God's plan. It wasn't a mistake that Ryan was cutting the ribbon, whereby one day he would be the lead pastor of the church he was raised in. I then realized in my spirit, something is going on here with this picture. The board opened up the due lead position to the whole team, by the way. And Ryan was the only one who stepped forward to lead this church if it was God's will. And I, I, I want to say something because I think it's important that you know this, not because of any reason, but because I want you to know the truth. My wife and I stood back. You can ask any board member. I never pulled the board member to the side. I never told the board what they should do. I never told them who should pass. We stood back and we prayed. We, is that correct? That is correct? We wanted it to be God's will for this church. I said something else to the church over the years. Folks, I'll step down if I see any harm coming to this church because of me. You won't have to let me go. I'll go myself. Because this is God's work and you don't mess with God's work. And you don't mess with what God is doing. So I was willing to step back any time over those 40 years if it would save this church being the church God wanted it to be. So we stood back and we let God do the vetting. And Don Emmel, who you met this morning, Worked with the church board. The church board worked with him. And they are the ones that vetted Ryan. I did put together a 12, 14-page uh, document on what a lead pastor looks like. That was a lot of what it looks like. Not that a lead pastor has to do everything I did. But I gave them what to look for. All the way from their family to their experience in the pulpit. What to look for in a lead pastor. Well, these two men, Aaron and Ryan along with all the hardworking teams and people that surround them, have taken the school and the church to new levels as part of the vision that God had already endorsed 70 years ago. Think about that, church. You know the old saying, ah, oh, your, your sons are a chip off the old block. I said, no, you got it backwards. These guys are blocks. 
off the old chip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there are blocks off the old chip. What God is doing through this church, folks, is absolutely awesome. The children that's being reached, the youth that's being reached, the hundreds of people every year that we feed and we, we help. You are known all up and down the state. You really are. I know some of these things. You are known up and down the state, especially heavily in this county. You can't, you know what? I'm all the time asking the text at Dallas, says, so do you go to church? You know, I'm, you know, I'm a preacher. I get to be a preacher there too, right? I'm not going to stop being a, what I am just because I'm in Dallas. Says, I'm going to be who I am in Dallas says, as anywhere else. And do you know how many times I see, you ever heard of a church called Calvary? Oh, yeah. I don't think I've found but one who's never heard of Calvary. And there was one lady working on me one day. She says, Pastor, you don't remember me, do you? I says, no. She says, you baptized me in water in your church. I says, really? She says, yeah, and I'm feeling a little convicted of working on you because I haven't been back. I said, well, you know what to do about that. <laughs> I want to tell you something about you. Let me tell you something about you folks. I did a survey in one of our Calvary Something God days a few years, several years before I retired. And we got turned in 1,500 responses. I think I had the team help me work with the responses. I worked with them. And we took the top 10 things that you wrote down. The top 10 things you wrote down is how, what you see about Calvary Church. What does it mean to you? What is your thoughts? We wanted to know what you thought about our church. And so we stuck our neck out in faith believing we're going to get a good response. 1,500 responses. Are you ready for the top three? The top three and the number one. I remember I kept all the stuff. Number one was the way we cared about our community. Wow. There's not a pastor on planet Earth could be more happy than that. To think that a church that could come together and be a giant bless me club and only think about themselves, what they were thinking about was the number one thing they liked about the church was because we were community minded, because we reached out to the community, because we cared about people outside of the walls of our church. Number two, which was told to us by a church expert, growth teacher, trainer internationally, said about pastors, if you think it's the preaching and teaching of the church, the speaking to your church be what it is, you got another thing coming. Well, guess what? He's got another thing coming. Because number two of 1,500 people, you said the preaching and the teaching of the truth in the church. Number two. Wow. Now, just so you know, I didn't let that go to my head because you've got Sunday school teachers. You've got team leaders that teach and preach. You've got all types of teaching and preaching. Church. I didn't think it was me alone. I think I was just part of the others because we value truth in this church. We value the Bible. We value doctrine. We value what God believes and who he is. We value that. And that's what we espoused over the years. Number three, guess what it was? The love they felt in this church. Folks, you can't get a better package than that. And you produced that package. Because you want to know why? You see, anybody can sit back and fill out a survey. Anybody can sit back and fill out a survey. But it takes another kind of person to fulfill in the survey what they wrote. You, as a church, have become a church that practices what it preaches. It practices what it believes. And you became a part of that process in that fulfillment. As goes the church, as goes the battleship, which is the church, you will, the people in our community, come to know Christ. Because of you, people in our community have come to know Christ and will. So what is the secret to the future? The secret is a divine move of God through the response of the body of Christ. It's that simple. 
a divine move of God, meaning God will move in the church that will respond as the body of Christ. God will move to the extent, say extent, God will move to the extent that the body of Christ responds, ready for this, to obedience to his word. When you go out and let your light shine, that's a spot. When you give today to the work of the Lord, that's response. When you take up a ministry and a job and you take up a service of the church to become a part of it, you may say, well, pastor, what I want to do would be so little. There's no such, there's no little thing with God. There's nothing too little and there's nothing too big for God. When we all pull together and work together. Oh, by the way, then there is that extra God initiates by his own sovereign will. In other words, when the church walks in obedience to God, you are walking in your own kind of revival. Then there are those times that God can bring that extra revival, that extra move, that extra impact of his spirit initiated by his own sovereign will. See, God knows the place, God knows the timing when he wants to do that and will do that. So what is the future for Calvary? Let's bring it to this moment. What is the future to Calvary? The title says it all. And I want you to say it with me. God is not done yet. Okay, your vocal cords were a little weak there. <laughs> One more time, because I know you weren't for sure which phrase, right? God is not done yet. So here's what I say to you. Look for the more. Look for the more to come. Let me tell you, when we could see those plans, they weren't good enough. When we could see that we need to go in phases. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, but when it came time, we wanted to buy more property next door for parking. I had it all lined up with the farmer who sold the original property to us. And uh, he ended up in the hospital. And uh, I went to visit him and pray with him because I was concerned about his soul. And it didn't turn out that we'd get the property because a family member, when the, the father died, a family member blocked that opportunity for us. We were hoping to get more property for parking because the Lord said, you got to spread to the left, you got to spread to the right. When you look at the highway, that's the right. We didn't have it. I said, Lord, what are we going to do? Well, God brought in a home called Torbett Funeral Home. And we became friends. And I talked with them. We talked together. They agreed to let us have their parking lot every Sunday, barring extreme cases for funerals, and he said he even works at trying to keep people out on Sundays if he can. And he even allowed us to put a sidewalk between our properties. God gave us the money back for this sanctuary, 250000 property. God knew ahead of time we wouldn't have to pay a dime for new parking. We got it free. As long as the church sits here, we got a free parking lot. Isn't God faithful? Keep on doing what you are doing. Improve on what you can do better. I'm retired five years. Do you know I'm still working on how I can improve myself as a helper? I really am. Honey, where are you? Is that not true? <laughs> she knows. She knows where to find me. And my, uh, she kicked me out of my office. At, I had a nice office at home. She kicked me out. She said, that's not my office. So I'm on the back porch in the corner and have my own office, my Bibles, my Faust, oh, I, I got a nice little office. And, uh, but I'm still improving. Do you know that when I'm preaching down at Subwayville, God is still laying new messages on my heart? Uh, do you think I'm just pulling off the old messages? Well, there are some I have because they're, they're God's word and there's never a bad time to teach God's word. But God is laying new messages on my heart, even for that little church. In fact, we have a friend here today from the suburb of the area. Is that you, Maria? God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. So, as you grow individually, the church in concert grows. And as the church grows in concert, it reaches its loss. And when you are equipped, God has something to grow. 
Let us equip you. Let us disciple you. You disciple others. And you're giving God what he needs to grow you in the church. Connect with those outside the walls. Stay close to each other. Be the weapon of war that God has called you to be based on Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. The, the seven things that make you a warrior for the Lord. You want to be a warrior on that battleship. Not sunbathing on the deck. Now you want to be at your guns. You want to be at your job on the battleship. Keep focused on him. For we cannot be like him unless we talk like him. Think like he did. Live like he lived. Do like he did. And that is a true disciple. A true disciple is one who talks like Christ, do what he did, live the right way he lived, and do like he did. And remember, God is never done. And God wasn't done when we came. God wasn't done when Angela and I retired. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? God is still not done. Why? Because it's his church. And we've been entrusted with the responsibility of taking this battleship forward. Don't sit at the docks. Get aboard the battleship. Get out there in the waters where the lost souls are, where they're drowning in their sin. They're drowning in their despair. They're drowning in their, in their distraughtness. Throughout the lifeline, throughout that gospel, throughout that word, let your light shine and watch God plant a seed that will bring it back a huge, huge harvest. Calvary still isn't big enough for what God has planned. And everyone said, amen. amen. Pastor, may I have a prayer of dedication or do you have something planned? Okay. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for today. You know, Lord, what I struggled with today in this pulpit was the many, many things I'd like to have said, but we knew there wouldn't be time but I want the people to have gotten a hold of a glimpse of you, what you did, how you provided for us miraculously in so many ways, and the work that's being done because of a congregation of people who care. And so, Lord, our dedication today is for the fact that we are asking you to help us become even more effective. And, Lord, to speak from my heart, those who are here today come but haven't really gotten a hold of the reins of the battleship, I pray that you'll speak to them. I pray that you move on their hearts. I pray that they'll step forward and say, what can I do to be a part of throwing out the lifeline to the sea of people that are in dire need of you? Granted, we pray, O oh Lord, and everyone prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.